Hey guys, thanks for joining me on my channel again. Of course, do more. It's all about being your own boss, retiring early, retiring rich, being the best that you can be. And today I spoke to a guy called Suhaimi Sulaiman, and I've never met the guy until today. I had never seen him before, and he blew me away at the time with his personality, with his charisma, with his positivity. And today, when I met him in person for the first time, he brought all that to the table. He talks about all the advice he would give to his younger self, to the young people around him. And I think you will enjoy this video as much as I did when I interviewed him. So if you like this video, please share it, uh, like it, and tell your friends all about it. So Jaime Salaiman, the Hi. man, the legend. No legend. And the legend continues. I can't believe I've never met you before. I, I know of you. I've heard you on radio. Uh, people know you and speak highly of you. And... Uh, Finally, we're in front of each other and you're here to tell your story. So let's start at the start, right? Where does Jaime Salaiman, the man, come from? Where was he born? Where did he go to school? Well, I was born in Malacca in 1962. That makes me 57 years old. Uh, um, early retirement, but suddenly there's a prime minister who's 94 years old. <laughs> so uh, then I said to myself, there's no such thing as retirement. So I continued working. So I have now my, I run my cafe, I have my backpackers hostel, I have my boutique. And other than that, I do my consultancy and training, uh, media training crisis and all that. Lah. I was born in Malacca. I went to school in Malacca and then I went to the Malay College in Kuala Kangsa. And then I won a government scholarship. I went to America. I did business administration, my degree. And and I went on to do my master's. I came back, worked for a bank. At that time, it was called Bank of Commerce Berhad. Today, it's called CIMB. I worked there for three years. And then after that, there was uh, uh, a, a TV station wanted somebody with a finance background. I applied and I got the job. So I was with TV3 from 1990 to 2003. And then I left. Uh, I Well, at that time, I already started my consultancy work. So I focused on my consultancy work from 2003. And then I got a call from Astro. They wanted to start something like a CNN. So I said to myself, Woo, this is good. You know, CNN in Basa, Malaysia. This is so good. So I decided to join uh, Awani. But uh, uh, I still uh, continue doing some consultancy work. So Awani started in 2007. And then I left in 2015 because that, uh, the entrepreneurial streak in me, you know, like who's going to come out. So I left in 2015, uh, focused on consultancy work. And then one fine day, the former group uh, CEO of uh, Astro, Dato Rohana Rosan, and the present group CEO, Henry Tan, uh, asked me for breakfast. So I went for breakfast with them. And then they said, straight to the point, okay, well, uh, how much do you want? We want to take you back. Uh, because election was coming up. So they needed someone, someone to help uh, you know, prepare Awani for election. So I told them one year. So I joined with a one-year contract and election didn't happen. And then it was extended for another year. Uh, year, uh, two years basically and then I uh, continued and then until last month no no il the early this month yeah and then I said I think it's enough so I decided to leave yeah not many reporter media people have the uh, entrepreneurial streak and do it with any success right and that, that makes you quite rare but um, you have the privilege of seeing the old media the new media you've mm -hmm. had the privilege of seeing uh, the old um, uh, architecture, if you like, of the industry, and you've also seen the disruption of the new industry, right? Um, I, I guess for, 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 for people out there, especially for younger people that want to go into media, that want to go into broadcasting, what are the things that they should be aware of nowadays? Okay, um, I saw a tweet this morning. Uh, someone sent me, uh, so, uh, uh, someone tweeted, I, I forgot what's the name of that person. Uh, today, if you want to be a reporter, you, 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 don't just, you, you cannot just be a good storyteller or a good journalist, but you also must know uh, analytics, you must know SEO, you must know uh, uh, um, um, Design uh, every single thing, you know, because that's basically what's needed uh, in journalism today. So, um, for example, in the last three years, when I was with Awani, it was no longer just storytelling, compelling content. No, it is basically uh, how to win, uh, how to be in the top ten of com score. You know, uh, uh, how do you win in clickbaits? How do you uh, make sure that your SEO is right? How, what, how do you tag? You know, these are the things that people need to learn other than just normal good storytelling, what, where, when, why, how. No, 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 no. Because now you need a totally different breed of reporter. That's number one. And if you are the leader of a, a, a news channel, uh, you really have to go away from the normal ADEX. Uh, um, getting people to advertise on your channel is no longer that. You know, it has to be 
be something totally, totally different. You know, because when I was there, I actually did lots of conferences and events because that's basically where the money was at that time. But then you come to think of it, how can you do this, you know, to finance the, the media business? So you really have to think differently to be successful today. So the demand for uh, good leadership in um, journalism, in broadcasting and whatever that you do when it comes to storytelling, it is a different requirement to totally. So you no longer look for good storytellers. You must be an expert in many, many other fields. Yeah, but so I mean, you know, um, it seems almost like a sea change now because back in the day, if you're a journalist, the only thing you could, were you expected to do was to sniff out a story get it before anyone else does and write it really well. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of financial journalists did really well. Uh, and th that was the hallmark of their ability. But if you're saying today that the journalists need to be so many things, yeah. are they forgetting the true original focus of journalism? Because otherwise you're spreading yourself too thin. No. Just because you're good in SEO doesn't mean you're a good journalist. No, you have to be everything or else you'll just miss it. You know, Because, uh, for example, yes, you can write a good story, so is everyone else. Yeah. So how but do you got to get the story in the first place? Yes, you get to have to get the story in the first place. But uh, somehow today you can actually sniff it better than the way when we first started many many years ago. So you really have to have other things too. If not, you're just a normal uh, reporter reporting for uh, a normal uh, uh, news channel or, or, or print or whatever. Yeah. So you must have other skills too. It's not just good storytelling. No way. Yeah, well, unfortunately, right, the old the giants of the past, the Astros, the Stars, the New Straits Times, the Malay Mails, all these guys, they're being, you know, badly left behind by the Facebooks and the Googles. In fact, the advertising money is in the Facebooks and the Googles of this world, the Instagrams of this world. Um, it's a sad state, almost, right, the industry now. How do you see all this playing out in the next three or five, three, say three to five years? Well, it's very difficult uh, because if not, I would have been paid millions, you know, to actually help out. I don't out. think anybody's figured it out. You know? Yeah, it, 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 it is a tough, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, okay, for example, yeah, when I was the editor-in-chief, uh, yes, you work very hard to get the great stories, yeah? So then you have, uh, for example, every day you have the 30% nation-building stories, you know? Then you have a 40% uh, 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 business stories and then of course you must have that 20% number stories that will bring you the number that will make you be in the top 5 of Comscore for example Yeah. now those twi that 20% story is basically the one that will actually help you stand out to be recognized by the advertisers Yeah. on the one hand you want credibility but on the other hand they also want numbers so this is basically the, the challenge that uh, I had to face when I was leading a, a news channel. So, so basically, uh, um, what do you do now? Do you want to be respected as a credible news channel? Or do you make sure that you have enough money to make sure that you can survive? You don't have to do your VSS or MSS. So it's a very, very tough industry. You know, and people are finding new ways of getting their messages across. No longer they use just the TV channel or the radio or perhaps even online because there are many, many other ways to actually get the messages. For example, I, I use this as an example. Yeah? I, now I understand why um, like the Facebooks or the Instagram of the world is doing so, 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 so good because I have a cafe in Malacca. When I first started, you know, so I said to myself, how do we get people to know my cafe? So what I did was, I, 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 I said I paid 73 bucks boost, you know, and all of a sudden people start, started coming to the cafe and I asked them, so how did you go, how did you know about this cafe? Macam mana tahu? And then they said, oh, Facebook. And then some said Instagram. Wow, it's working. So I just pay 70 bucks for this one, 90 bucks for this one, and then I, I got my advertisement out for six days. That's enough. So I can actually target. So I said, I want people in Malacca, rich people, 3,000, 4,000 and above. Uh, they read certain, certain books. They travel around the world. They speak English. And, uh, and they like fashion. They like food. And, and they're very adventurous. So that's basically the demographics. And I got them. So then they send back the results to me. They say, oh, your uh, content actually reached 8,000 and 800 people actually were, uh, were very much engaged uh, in your, uh, at your site. So 800 people for a cafe, that's very good for me already. I can't even host 800 people in my cafe at any one time. I can only host about 60 people. So that's very good for me. So that is why I think, you know, uh, this is the challenge and this is basically what's, um, uh, this is the competition uh, for the, oh my God, my broom. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I sprained my ankle. Thank God there's a broom, you know. 
<laughs> so I took off that the you know the the sweep part, and so I use this as a as a tongkat. You know? <laughs> the Malays always need tongkat. You know. <laughs> There's a lot uh, of innuendo with that phrase, but uh, um, just uh, just just think just think on 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 your views on the media industry, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's 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 almost um it's it's almost ironic because the Googles and the Facebooks, the ones who are, you know, purveying your your ad, yeah. they also aggregate all the news stories from the media portals, mm. and they don't pay for the news. They rely yeah. on the yeah. NSTs and the media primas and yeah. the Astros yeah. to produce the content and then they just grab it and put it into the platform where there's also email, there's also YouTube, yes. there's also Instagram, there's also social media and then they start advertising around it. So so if you were st- if you knew what you do now, which mm-hmm. of, course, of course you do, yeah. would you be starting a news channel? And if you do know all that with, the, uh, with your experience, how would you treat it differently? Uh... I wouldn't say it's a news channel. I would really focus on what uh, pr- uh, I can. Uh, okay, let, let me just rephrase this. It's not a news channel. It will be. Uh, uh, it could be a travel news channel. Very specific. Okay. Very very specific. Because then I can actually target the people who would come, and 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 advertise, advertisement will be very very targeted. So that would work. Uh, if it's just a general news channel, I do not think it will work because it's really, really tough. Okay, so you go vertical into vertical. Yes, because you know why? Because a news channel, what's the biggest uh, uh, cost? It's basically people. Your staff-related cost is just so high. And, uh, and good people are expensive. Exactly. And um, uh, we are in the business of storytelling and storytelling cannot survive without storytellers. So you have to pay a lot of money for these people to come in. And you can't, afford it uh, in, at today's rate because uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram whatever is giving you an alternative you see if, if you're a TV marketeer if you're a TV media sales guy when you go and see a client you can tell you, you tell a client oh uh, you have to invest 200,000 500,000 you know and then suddenly uh, uh, I, I become an entrepreneur so I just put 60 bucks 90 bucks and I can put everything in there and it worked for me so how do you compare then so the way things are being marketed is totally totally different today and i can just pay these people just using my personal credit card yeah. you know yeah i don't need to sign a contract and, and all that so this is this is really really great well the malaysian media industry is now is, is in a huge existential crisis right and there's a lot of institutions out there that don't want to close down they don't want to sack people they want to continue but under a new guise mm-hmm. so if you were to be coming back with a new institution whether it's this a b or c let's not name any names mm-hmm. right how would you do it differently Honestly, I think Malay- the Malaysian market is just so small. So you have to be focusing on the ASEAN region. And it should. And de- I wanted to try to do that, right? Try to be in the region. Uh, th- that was different. Was- th- th- that, was a, that was a different Awani then. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Awani under my regime was totally different. You know? uh, but, what I'm, uh, uh, but what I think could work is, okay... Um, Indonesia has a population of 260 million. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and then there are Malay speaking people in uh, Singapore, of course, in Brunei, and also um, southern Thailand and perhaps southern Philippines. Now, that is more than 300 million. Okay. Now, if you only get 10% of that, it's only 26 million. That's even bigger than people that you can actually target in Malaysia. Now, there is in that space, there is no specific media doing it in Bahasa Nusantara, basically Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia. Now, uh, that could be a better proposal uh, because uh, that language is understood by the majority of the people in this area rather than English. Yeah, English, I don't think English is widely spoken in Indonesia. They understand Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia. So if someone asks me to help out, uh, so I would say this is the way to go. And uh, the way to go is not on your normal television, satellite or whatever. It is through your digital, your online thing. And that's how you can actually manipulate your SEO and all that. Correct. But from a commercial perspective... From a commercial perspective, you have to marry that with events and conferences and also okay, other so things. Okay, so on-ground events. You yes. must have on-ground events because um, uh, the amount of money that people pay for online uh, advertising is just so small. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, can't pay yeah. for... And a Malaysian Chuang, yeah. enterprise might not want to be seen in Indonesia because it doesn't sell products in Indonesia. Right? Not if, for example, not if the news is read by Siti Nohaliza, yes. you know, or, or maybe Sheila. 
You know, so so things are. People are changing. Things are changing, and I think it's you must have the right formula uh, to actually enter this market, and the avenue is already there. Uh, definitely, it's not totally. It's, uh, it is not the traditional media. It's the new media. It's the digital media. So you have to find ways to actually reach the market, and that is where you need this data and all that. And I think it can be done. Yeah, because for example, uh, uh, when when my old station, the station that I left uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, when we did tsunami coverage uh, in Indonesia, our SEO was right, so we did the right tagging and all that. We had a lot of people tuning in to us from Indonesia, so we worked closely with Kompas TV then. So that way, we realized that hey, this is actually the way to go to the Indonesian market. It's just that we have not given our Self some time to actually study the real formula or the right way of going in, but from the data that we got, it's basically hey, look, something is working here. So I think we need to just sit down and do more research. You don't have to to to. to I don't think it's quite difficult to understand why they are actually viewing in. Yeah. So under Bahasa Nusantara 2.0 yeah. in your yeah. in your vision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, online, uh, sorry, offline events and exhibitions and conferences yeah. I- I- in real brick and mortar yeah. would be the prime revenue driver. But how would you how would you hire people? Would it be stringers? Would it be full time people? How would, how would you? I do think that? it has to be a mix of, of 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 that. Yeah, because there are lots of talented people everywhere, and um, you have to look at people who would provide you something totally different, not your normal. Uh, media salesperson, or your normal producer, or your normal uh, reporter. So it has to be somebody who's really, really enterprising, who has this entrepreneurial streak in them, and yet, and and also they are a great storyteller. So this is the kind of person, people that you actually have to hire. Yeah, and then you need to find the money to back that idea. And right now, the media industry is so moribund that um, there's not a lot of money chasing it. Yeah, but because because we are we are looking at a small market, so that's why your market has to be big. Yeah. yeah, because if you're just looking at Malaysia, you will not survive. So, so that's why you have to look at ASEAN in a big way. So what would make Suhaimi Salaman come back to the media industry? <laughs> Get, pay me more. <laughs> but, so that is worth it, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, uh, the hassle and the pressure is just too much, you know? So sometimes you have to ask yourself, whether, is this worth it? Yeah. yeah. So now I'm, uh, right now I'm enjoying myself. I'm at the kitchen of my cafe cooking. Yeah, I'm designing my batik shirts. Uh, and by the way, uh, now that I have my boutique in Malacca, I I just realized that brick and mortar brings in more money compared to online. I was selling my batik shirts online for the past five years yeah. and it's not as brisk as having a brick and mortar in Malacca because you know when tourists pass by, they hey nice design you know and we carry you as dollars and you're selling in ringgit, okay I can buy so many of these shirts. Yeah, yeah so you, got it's good. Point. you got a point yeah. because in America Microsoft's opening is its physical store, yes. Apple's got a physical store, Amazon's got their Whole Foods and what have you. But you know, now in this day and age, 2019, near the end of the year, um, what would be the advice you give to the buddy, you, to the budding media broadcast guy? You said one, he's going to be he or she's going to be multi talented, yes. and uh, able to learn mm-hmm. new tricks, right? Mm-hmm. What are the other, other two things? I, I I guess you really have to stand out as someone who's super brilliant, you know, uh, um, where you need to be very very well differentiated because and. This is what I always, uh, I, I, I told uh, um, when I was in Awani, I told the reporters, you know, you cannot continue reporting on beliau berkata demikian, beliau berkata tambah beliau lagi, you know, he said this, uh, uh, in his speech he said, uh, he, he uh, you know, it's the same kind of reporting, paraphrasing, yeah. it, it cannot be that. Yeah? For example, if something happens, you have to immediately uh, tell whoever that's consuming your news, what it means to us, what's in it for the country, what is in it for us, rather than just telling what's happening. So you need a different way of telling the news. Yeah, so, okay, quick uh, little direction off to the side. How, in your opinion, how, how is Malaysia today compared to, say, two, three years ago? How has it improved and, or, or changed? Uh, well, I believe, okay, when, when I was at Awani, okay, uh, um, before, before me... Uh, before the election, before G14, uh, before G14, I received a lot of calls. You know, not to do this, not to do that. From you know, so many people, and after that, there were no calls. Yeah, there were no calls at all. It was only up to you, uh, up to you to actually tell the story. So, you, but you have to be responsible, lah. So you, you actually, that's that's that, that there's hope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving forward, I I think that um, you need to get uh, uh, the message right. 
uh, uh, I think what people need now is hope in in when, when they read the news. Uh, if there's too much bickering. Uh, people don't like that. People don't yeah. like that because hey, enough lah, jangan gaduh lah, come on lah, you know, tight already, you know. Because what we want now is okay. I want to move on. Okay, what's in it for me? Okay, uh, uh, how how do um, how can you make my uh, ringgit stretch more? What what more can I buy? People want that now. So I think uh, people in leadership should know that uh, we need. Uh, I I always advise my. You see, I also counsel uh, uh, my clients are also politicians. You know, some good politicians, some really really stupid politicians. You know. Uh, 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 some really good ones. So I tell them, politics is the business of giving hope. You know, now if you do not have hope in whatever that you say in that particular day, people will feel so sad and depressed. You know, and that will actually be reflected in the economy. So there must be hope. So whether you are able to achieve that is another story. But when they see you working towards that, that is also hope. So that is so important in a country like us. Yeah, yeah. So it's so true because that's what politicians do, right? Um, but on your ability as an entrepreneur, and not many journalist guys are entrepreneurs, right? Do you think entrepreneurs are made, or do you think they're born? I believe. Okay, this is where I would argue with so many people. You know why the Chinese are so good at business? You know why the Chinese are so because their mother, their father, their grandfather, their grandmother, their great grandfather—they are all business people. You know, so it's in their DNA. It was passed you from one. You sincerely believe that? I sincerely believe that. I'm not a doctor, but I believe in that. Okay. After this, when I get out of your studio, people will fire me with all this theory, lah. <laughs> that I don't care. But I believe in it. You know why? Because you see, um, um, uh, I noticed that, you know, it's very easy to introduce a certain concept to the Chinese. Yeah. That's what my father believed. Uh, he, my late father, he believed in that because uh, my father was the only Malay teacher. Uh, uh, who was uh, a teacher in a Chinese school in Malacca teaching mathematics? That's you know, very, very that's rare. very rare. Malay tak pandai uh, mathematics, Chinese pandai mathematics. But there was a Malay teacher. His name is Sulaiman Atan, teaching mathematics in a Chinese school. So my father was so impressed with all these Chinese family businesses. You know what he did? Uh, so he bought this piece of land in Limbongan, Malacca. At that time, I remember I was in Standard One, 1969. Uh, so he built a house. So next to the house is this huge piece of land as big as a basketball court. So he forced all of us, the we, three of us uh, brothers. So okay, tanam poko sayo. So we planted lah, kobe, not kobe, uh, kangkong, um, bayam, whatever, spinach, uh, ladies' finger, beans, eh? and nobody planned what happened later on. Who's going to consume all this? And then my father said, brilliant. Now you sell to all the neighbors. So at the age Fantastic. of... So, so I, I started selling Kang Kong at the age of six or seven and I was in Standard One. And guess what? I enjoyed it because we got to keep the money. You know, and when we go to... At uh, that time, they called tuck shop. They didn't, didn't call it canteen. Uh, you go to the tuck shop and... You know, I don't know. Do, do they call tuck shop today? I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, no. Tuck shop means canteen like, at that oh, time. Canteen, so go to yeah. the tuck shop. And, and, uh, for, and I think we were very rich then. So we brought 50 cents to school. And that was, that was like super duper rich. Yeah. So we got to keep our money. So then uh, I actually enjoyed business. Now, that was what the Chinese uh, family... Uh, have been teaching their kids for generations. So that my father was a Malay man, never had business before in his life. But because he's associated, uh, he he associated a lot with the Chinese uh, businessman. So he said, "This is something good about the Chinese that the Malays would have to learn." So he passed that to us. You know what? I enjoyed doing that. So when I was when I went to Malay College and I got really good grades, I was sent by the government to America, and the scholarship was so. S- Seek it, you know. Uh, we couldn't afford lots of things, so I decided, me and my friends. So I'm very entrepreneurial. Hey, let's sell curry puffs. You know, the, all these matsali would love our curry puffs. Don't make it so spicy. <laughs> so we we made the curry puffs bigger. So we sold at fifty cents. So we got so much money. We bought ourselves cars. I bought a Renault. They bought this really ugly that's car. A, that's yeah, a lot of that's yes, a yes, yes, lot yeah, money, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And and um, my friend bought this really ugly car called Gremlin, only in America. So you Google Gremlin, Gremlin. It's a. Uh, it, it looks like a. Uh, It looks like an elephant, you know. But but we managed to we bought cars because uh um but what my father did because uh, I actually lived in me, so I was actually entrepreneurial, and then uh, I came back. I I uh, when I was in TV three, uh, I, I actually was the one who drew up the syllabus uh, when when they started Academy TV three. So we actually did consultancy on and training. For uh, companies, uh, 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 in in uh, on uh, that's another arm of Academy TV3. So I was part of it. So that gave me the confidence of doing this. Now, when 
uh, when I ran Awani, when I was managing Awani, I actually ran it like an entrepreneur. So I, I got a little bit of a free hand to actually uh, decide on certain things. So it is very important to have that entrepreneurial skills ever uh, since you are young. If not, it's very difficult for you later on. Yeah. Yes, you go to MBA school, lah, but then you, you don't know how to do it because you have never done it before. So for me, I was given the exposure at a very young age. It is so important because your parents, and I remember um, Azran Osman Rani who came yeah. in here, his parents were particularly keen to let them, uh, his their kids, right? Yeah. And Azran was one of them, to express themselves. And they were surrounded by books. And Very important. And his ability to communicate is what has yes. given him such a big boost in his career. Yeah. So, and you were exposed to business in, in from a very early age. Yeah. You, you, you learned how to sell. Um, but unfortunately, that's not something which is prevalent among everybody in Malaysia. Yeah. What would be your advice to young kids coming out who are not coming from that kind of like entrepreneurial background? What do you suggest they do? I think you have to be, uh, you see, okay, this is the problem. We're so polarized now. I don't know why. During, during my time, you know, uh, that is Mrs. Kwa. Mrs. Kwa was a, a, a Baba Nyonya who lived next door. Uh, you know, so I would go to her house and then she would, you know, Sometimes I would have dinner, and then my mother, hey, balik lah, don't go, why, don't catch on Mrs. Kwa. So, you know, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something that you learn from somebody who, who, who has a different culture. Yeah. yeah. So you learn. So like my father, my father is an expert at that Sempua thing, you know, the calculator, the, the Chinese abacus calculator. Thing, yeah. yeah, the abacus, yeah. So, so you learn a lot. So I said, so I, I looked at my dad, so, eh, ayah, ni apa benda ni? You know, you learn about binary, zero, one, one, zero, this is it. So I still couldn't figure out at that time. So my father, oh, never mind, you know that I better watch TV. Uh, so uh, you learn a lot of things. So um, okay, one thing. Uh, okay, this is what I'm facing right now as a consultant. I realized that uh, there are so many Malay entrepreneurs because they are the first generation uh, doing business. Uh, unlike the Chinese, maybe they're the sixth or seventh generation. So they have it in their DNA. So there's no Malay DNA business. Yeah? So they want to learn. So basically what they do is they're looking for mentors. They're looking for new knowledge and all Role that. Role models. And Role stuff, models. Yeah. Yeah. So in my case, I have the experience. And I, I ran a, a media company before. So basically, uh, I can actually help them with okay uh, messaging, branding, differentiating. That's basically what they, what they need. Yeah, so I actually help them and I get paid for it. So I, I do lots of consultancy work for this group of people. So they need that, they need that. Explain the Malay culture. Because the Malay culture is very complex and very deep, but not many people have the insight into it. What, what, what drives the... Um... Um, uh, I'm a different Malay because my father taught uh, mathematics in a Chinese school. Uh, you know, and but you got the best of both worlds. Isn't yes, it? because my yeah. father, he spoke fluent Hokkien. You know, um, um, so for, I, I guess... Um, um, you know Mahatun Mahathir's Malay Dilemma, which he wrote yeah. in 1973? Yeah. How right or how wrong was he? I think, I think the Malays are really hungry for success. But I think what's lacking is because their next door neighbour uh, may not be a businessman. Or, or, or someone that can actually share the experience of running a business. I think that's basically is holding them back. Now, if they have many friends who are actually doing lots of uh, 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 trading and all that, they will have... I was invited to give a talk a couple of uh, months back, uh, no, I think about three years back, um, at this uh, convention uh, organized by ABS. ABS is Ainun Business School, you know. I've never heard of Ainun Business School before. Apparently, what they did was they tried to help other Malay entrepreneurs. These are the small micro, uh, the, the micro SMEs, yeah. To my surprise, there were more than 1,000 people attending the talk. So they want to be their own boss? Yes. They want to be in charge of yes. their life, right? So, and then when I met them later, so I said, what made you come? Because there are so many of you, I've never uh, uh, given a talk because uh, uh, they wanted to listen to my story on how from journalists I started designing baju batik and selling baju batik. It's just that story and that inspired them. So I said, why so many of you come? And they said, because, you know, we are the first in our uh, family who actually started business. So we don't have references. We don't have mentors. That's why we come here to see why, how other Malays are very successful. My God, that's a, that's a big uh, uh, group uh, wanting this new knowledge. So, so the Malays wants to be they, they want to be successful. It's just that I guess they don't see their next door neighbor doing it. So if 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 they see other people doing it, I think it's, it, it will be easier for them. And um, yeah, I, I think that's 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 that's, that's the main thing. Yeah, I've got this innate belief, so I mean that yeah. everybody, boy or girl, man or woman, wants to be their own boss. They want to be in charge of their own life, right? Yeah. 
they want to be able to have enough money in their pocket to do whatever they want, right? So they want to be able to, in a way, retire early, right? And I think also, innately, people want to be the best that they can be. In the sense that they want to fulfill all their potential, they want to go traveling where they want to, they want to be as fit or as healthy as they can. Because we are now realize that health is wealth, right? Yep. Time with their loved ones is wealth. But not enough information out there to help you get to that point. Yep. Um, so from the perspective of the young, say Malay boy or girl, yeah. right, who is not immersed in these things, yeah. right, what is your advice to them? You, um, I don't know, because if, if you're not immersed in it, how would you appreciate and how would you see this as a great thing for me to venture into, you know? So it is, it is quite tough. So this is where I feel that, you know, um, I don't know uh, what needs to be done, but... Uh, you, okay... Okay, my, my, another thing that there's a, there's a common belief, there's a common ideology among the Chinese people that the Chinese people became such good business people be, be, because through tough times. Mm-hmm. Hard knocks, right? You try, you fail, you get up again. And we, you know, the, the Chinese have come yeah. through many centuries of hardship and natural disasters and yeah. what have you. So they've come through the ringer and yeah. they've come out the other side. Now those, those that have survived are the ones that you see today. You don't see the ones that have gone bankrupt or died mm-hmm. or, or, or become malnourished and passed away. Um, so you have to go through the hard times mm-hmm. to get the good times. Yeah. But Malaysia is trying to fast track that mm-hmm. with all the assistance. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's working though. Uh, do you think? Do you think there's a there's a there's a way forward on this? I think it would work if the person who is the recipient or whatever assistance uh, is someone who is really really true. Uh, genuine and 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 they they do lots of research and they are really passionate about what they do because but come on we were both young right at one stage we were both in our teens we wanted to do all these things but we do, at that time what did we know I I certainly had no idea hey, but I, I did it right I sold I sold kangkong and I I realized that this is basically how to make money when I was in did America did you do extensive market research and uh, I, because because see, or did see, you just do it through trial and error no it's not trial and error because actually we calculated you know so we were calculated how many houses you know? so because we really at, at that time we wanted to buy something I don't know what it was huh? so we needed to have like ten ringgit for that weekend so we actually calculated how many houses so that's basically research and data back. no so that's data that's analytics for you you know yeah. so we actually did that now that's very basic but 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 for today you see for uh in fact when i want to start it, when, when i started my cafe i did lots of research and and and, and I, I used lots of data but i believe that uh you have to fast track uh but along the way somebody would just you know use the system to yeah the potential for abuse right of course of course they yeah. will they will always be there but at the end of the day i i think you you have to make sure that at least 80% will be successful. If not, you know, it's, it's a waste because the other 80% will, will also help the community. So it is like an umbrella thing. If you're successful, you employ more people. When you're successful, you have more suppliers, you know, you can uh, yeah, distribute, yeah. It, which is good for the nation. So I think it's, it, you must do that. Yeah? I mean, certainly by and large, in the last 30 years, there has been a big um, expansion of the middle class and especially among the booming Putra class as well. Yeah. Today, you see some of the some of the biggest cars and the biggest houses are, are owned by Malay people, right? Mm-hmm. And may, maybe 30, 40 years ago, that was not the case. Mm-hmm. So there's been definitely some success stories. In fact, more than a few success stories. Yeah, but I only admire people who actually work hard and people who actually use their money. I... I use my own money, you know, I use my own money, I didn't borrow anybody's money, so, and then I use my own research and all that, nobody assisted me, but I managed to do it on my own, so if I can do it, anybody, can, anybody right? else can, you know, just, just focus, passionate about what you do, and, 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 and just do it, of course, you know, not, uh, I fail too, uh, uh, but make sure that out of 10, you only fail 3, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, don't be stupid. Uh, don't have the VC mentality. VC say, okay, ten. You know, you can fail nine, but that one thing, that one idea, must must cover for the nine. Cannot, you we know, because you're entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. Nah, there's no way. Yeah. Okay, so you told me earlier that you're 57, right? Yes. My father's generation, by the time you're 55, yeah. you're you're retired, right? You're out playing golf or whatever, right? Sending the grandkids to school. You are going great guns. So, 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 what is your so Jaime Suleiman's definition of happiness? Happiness is uh, I'm happy every single day. Uh, you know, um, without some, sounding too corny, lah. Yeah, no, not corny at all. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm happy when I can do something that I want. Uh, that, okay, uh, to tell you the truth, when I was very, very young, okay, um, 
uh, I was very uh, I really admire this singer his name is A Ramli you have no idea who he is A Ramli was a very famous Malay singer at that time so he wore his hair something like the Beatles yeah so I realized oh my god this A Ramli is so good looking uh, his voice is so good I want to be a singer so I told my dad I said ayah I mean nak jadi penyanyi so my father just looked at me no 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 no, no. you would have been mortified uh, right? yeah yeah so you either be an accountant or you be a doctor or you be a lawyer So I said, okay, lawyer, accountant. Okay, like accountant quite close. Lah, yeah? So I studied. I studied and then I got my business degree. I got my MBA. I came back, worked for a bank. And then later on, so I told my dad, okay, I've done what you wanted me to do, which is close to accountant. Now I'm going to be a, a journalist. I'll be so famous. I go in front of the TV every day. Uh, so you know, now it's my decision. So my father said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know? And then later on in life, and then now that I've retired from mainstream media, so I, I said, I always wanted to be a singer. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a singer. You know, now singing does not mean that you have to produce an album. You have to sell in at Spotify. You have to, uh, you know, you have to have a, a label representing you. It is just like a painting. You know, so you paint something. You know, you take your brush, your oil painting, and you paint. That's a work of art for me. Singing is a work of art. In fact, you know, I just sprained my ankle with this cane. I'm going to gender by it today after this interview. I want to record my music video. I uh, I have three songs now. Original. Songs you composed. My friend, okay, my friend. His name is Isla Ibrahim. Isla Houdin Ibrahim is his full name is Isla Houdin Ibrahim. So he goes with a glamorous name, Isla Ibrahim. Now I went to school with him at Malay College. He's very talented. He's a composer. He composed songs for uh, great singers. Uh, he also does a lot of corporate uh, work, you know. And uh, uh, he's in his retirement mode, just like me. And he said, "So I mean, you know, you know what, you know." I like your voice, you know. <laughs> of course, you like my voice. I have three original. No, I have one original song. You know, I want you to sing my song. I said, yes. It's about time they recognize my talent. <laughs> so I actually went to his studio. So um, and I said, no, no. Actually, I have three songs. I said. So I re- we we recorded the three songs. It sounded. I think I sounded quite good. You know, for somebody without any training, and I, I couldn't even read. Uh, you know, the musical notes and all that. So I recorded the songs. Now, now, you know what makes me happy. Uh, it's like painting. So uh, singing is something like painting. Now I'm recording my video clip. I'm going to put my video clip in my Facebook account, and sooner or later I'm going to do something like you know this uh, Anthony Anthony Robbins uh, or, or Harold Robbins is the Tony, one. Who, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Tony uh, Robbins uh, and also this Kawasaki. Guy Kawasaki. Uh, no, so, so this guy who Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki. Yeah, the guy who would go and give talks and all that. Now the Malay community they love to be informed, uh, uh, educate. Uh, you inform, educate, and entertain the Malays. They like to do that. So I was thinking, why don't I have something like that? You know, I do a, a you know, a road show where I sing and I give advice on branding, crisis That's a great management, idea. Great and idea. I, actually, I'm planning with my team. So you'll see me doing all this uh, and targeting the Malay market because the Malay market they really need mentors, they really need references and all that. So I'm planning to do that. So the painting that's supposed to make me happy is now churning money for me. You see, I always think I just just don't do things for nothing. You know, I'm quite smart. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and who better than you, Sami Sliman, to be the uh, the role model? Uh, But let's have a taste. Come on, so 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 give us a taste of the, of the song. Maybe do do you know? Give us a little. Uh, okay. Um, um, okay. I have it. Uh, in in my car, but I can actually sing for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, which song? So the, uh, 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 which song? Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, uh, see, so now I've got this so distracted. Uh, <laughs> how 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 does this? That um 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 okay um ah uh, ada ka ada juga ah uh, uh, juga ada. Waktu kita bodoh, salah pilih, kita yakin itu jodoh. Jika cinta tak perlu tetes air mata, jika sayang, mengapa sering berdusta? Uh, wait for the video clip. Uh, <laughs> Do you know that uh-huh. Justin Bieber uh-huh. became Justin Bieber uh-huh. through YouTube? Yeah. 
You don't know. You don't. You just never know what might happen. So I mean, I just cleared my YouTube channel, so that's why I, I'm planning to put my three video clips in in my YouTube channel. You might just go viral, man. Yeah, I, I'm targeting the old market, so I'm I'm looking at. You see, uh, the song will not appeal to the younger kids. Yeah. You never know. Uh, yeah, you never know. Yeah, because there are some people who actually love old men. Uh, uh, but it would appeal to the Indonesian market somehow. I think so. So two hundred and sixty. Two hundred sixty million, million yeah. Indonesian. I just want the ten percent. <laughs> which is only 26 million come on Chuang this is the time for me to go you know what could go wrong there's, there's not much investment in it you know so I I just paid the people who actually produced the video clip that's all if there's one thing we all learn from Tun Mahathir yeah. life begins when you're a little bit more advanced yes. he's 94 yes. look at him yeah. Amazing. Nobody's going to retire now. Yes. Nobody. I, uh, yeah, I deserve a second career, you know. Uh, now I'm 57, uh, if I live to be that long. La. So, uh, 57. So, I want to really, really retire at 77. You know, I want to be like my friend, you know, who could... Uh, um, Chun Wai Chun Wai boasted the other day Wong Chun Wai uh, Wong Chun Wai yes yeah, the star yeah. Chun Wai said oh I just came back from Rwanda you know seeing the gorillas and all that so the, and then before that he went uh, to the North Pole these are uh, the bucket list things uh, yes yes uh, Aurora Borealis I said I just looked at him okay I want to do something like what Chun Wai is doing with Tan Sri Liu Kisin, you know go to Rwanda see the gorillas I think I'll do that at 77 by then I'll be a multi-millionaire you know doing what I do what I love doing la. why don't you go now because when you're 77 you're not going to be able to climb those mountains or to board those boats or to cross those fjords uh, there are lots of things that I want to do now you know I, I, I'm, I'm building three four different businesses so I think uh, I have enough on my plate at the moment yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so what does retirement mean to you there's no such thing as retirement retirement is uh, basically seven o'clock uh, you're tired and you just have coffee and you enjoy company of friends. To me, that's retirement and then you sleep. And then the next day you work. There's no such thing as retirement. You can never retire because the day you retire, you will die fast. <laughs> that's what Lee Kuan Yew said. Yes, because, because then things are not functioning. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I saw an advertisement uh, recently, uh, a Malay advertisement about tumbesaran. Tumbesaran means, you know, uh, your brain suddenly all this things come together and then you become clever it's happening to me now at 57 believe it or not <laughs> <laughs> it's, everything's starting to make a lot yes, more sense yeah, a lot yeah. more sense and I think I'm wiser now if I were to start my business let's say uh, 10 years ago it would not work because I would not have that wisdom that I have today so what you know now that you didn't know 10 years ago uh, a lot of things you know it's basically about confidence about managing people about uh, being this fatherly figure though I'm not married I don't have kids and all that but I think I'm a better father than some of these married people uh, you know so because because if you run a business, you have to run it like a family. You have to be the father figure, you have to be the mother figure. So you have to be, uh, the, the uh, it has to be run with love. You know, you cannot say that you don't do this. You know, it's like an employee, you, you report the subordinate. It's not going to work as a startup. You know, it's very, very challenging running a startup. So a startup has to be run with love. So that is basically how I approach business. If I were to do it 10 years ago, I wouldn't know how to do it. You know? What about the typical rules of management? Because if you run it like a family and yeah. you, lo you love them like as if you're all their own. Yeah, but you also punish your kids. Yeah, so how uh. do you do that, right? Without them losing their trust in you or morale or whatever. Well, uh, you have to be strict. I, I fired somebody recently. Uh, so basically, it doesn't mean that if you uh, run things with love, you cannot be strict. You know? So it's, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. So you can do both. So as long as people see it as this is a place that I love to go to work every single day, then it would work for you. So what does the concept of happiness mean to you? Happiness to me is uh, when I see people smile and people love what they do. And you know, one day uh, after work, you can actually sit down and just smile at, oh, I've completed something good today. To me, that's happiness. Uh, instead of, oh, lots of money, you know, lots of money will also bring you Lots of pain and all that. Oh, you have to pay taxes and all that. You know, so it's, it's interesting. Interesting yeah. because a lot of people believe there's a direct link between money and happiness. Money can buy happiness, lah. You think so? Uh, if if you can also give you a lot of distress. Yeah, if you, uh, if you're materialistic, you know. But for me, it's not. Uh, to me, it's it's basically seeing other people smile. It's 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 the biggest happiness for me. Yeah, because you got your cafe, you yeah. got your clothing line, your batik yeah. line. Yeah. You've got your, your hostel, your, your backpacker. Um, tell me about that business. Uh, it's doing quite well, actually. Uh, I didn't expect it to uh, um, 
Uh, because I would say that my I burn my money after for, for the first six months or seven months, but after the second month, uh, thank God the puasa month uh, started in our second month, yeah, and then I introduced uh, the the uh, ver- the cheapest I think cheapest buffet buka puasa in Malacca, fifteen bucks, fifteen wow. ringgit. That's yes, right. yeah, simply because that's a my marketing tool. You know, I pay for the cost of the uh, food, yeah. Uh, so I, it's you, you, you break even when it comes to the food and all that. But uh, you, you do a marketing bliss. So except for the first day, all other days full house, and from there we got repeat customers. People keep on coming to the place, and then they would buy uh, clothes and all that. So it was good for me. So now we are we are launching our uh, backpackers hostel. So for me, that's something that uh, that's a that's a cash flow business. Uh, and and other than that, I do lots of consultancy and training, crisis management, and all that lah. Yeah, so the typical entrepreneur would try and you know get the model right and then replicate it, right? That's the typical, not even Chinaman. That's like the the American model, right? Yeah. Get it right and then and then expand as fast as possible, mm-hmm. right? Raise capital, expand as fast as possible, uh, and then cash out within like say three years, right? Thirty branches, thirty hotels, thirty cent sambal. So yeah. What's the uh, that, that's not what I have in mind. Yeah. So what what I'm doing, what what I'm doing at the moment is. You see, this is what I learned from my previous organization. Uh, we learned about ARPU, average revenue per unit. But now we call it RPAC, average revenue per customer. So now we are introducing premium uh, dishes. For example, you know, there are some people who would love to. Uh, um, well, this is Malacca. When we when we first open, we serve uh, sambal uh, ayam, sambal ikan, and all that. Uh, sambal, sorry, korma ayam, and all that. And then later on, we go premium. So we go premium means uh, lots of pasta, big pasta and all that. And then we introduce more premium and premium and premium. So, uh, so the challenge for me now is not necessarily you have more outlets, but you have more RPAC, average revenue per customer. So that is how we expand and expand and expand. So for me, the expansion is not so much the cafe because it's very difficult to get workers uh, in, in, the, in the F&B industry. Yeah, it's, right. it's really, really tough. So it's good to have... Uh, a, a nice cafe which will make bring you money and all that as long as you pay back for whatever investment that you're making but for me the expansion is in, in my consultancy and training uh, that's good because in consultancy and training you don't have to spend so much for renovation and all that you know it's basically your ideas and your brains you know so so uh, there's not much investment that you need to make except for you need to constantly educate yourself so what are the message to your clients your corporate clients what do you tell them what are the takeaways? What is the Suhami Sulaiman uh, message to the corporates? Uh, basically, most of them, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I would say 80% of my training is on managing crisis on how do you deal with the media, uh, basically. So how do you deal with the media? Uh, how do you deal with the media? Basically, how do you deal with people like me? Um, you see, this is the good thing because I actually train many, many reporters in the industry. So reporters are trained in such a way that they have templates in their head. You know, after uh, not you like you're the you're senior, you finance financial reporter, hebat. You know, so when whenever you send a reporter out, yeah, when they come back, they will tell the editor. Okay, the editor will ask them, what are the three things that, you know, that's so important at the press conference? Number one, number two, number three. So I will tell my clients, reporters are trained in such a way that they need three things for you to tell them. Yeah, what would be that three things? Okay, now reporters would ask you question. You know, now when you meet reporters, you please make sure that you answer their questions, but not all the questions. You do an eighty twenty. You do breaching. Yeah, so meaning the reporter will think that they. Oh, no, no. Let me rephrase that. No, all the reporters will kill me after this. <laughs> uh, uh, You're giving uh, all the secrets away. Uh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, you answer their question, but you sell more of what you would want them to write. So basically, you answer their question. 20%, but the other 80%, you tell your side of the story, it's a lot, ju- it's juicier than the answer to the question. So that's basically how you position your brand and how you differentiate your brand. That's what I always tell my clients. And do they do it well? They do very, very well. Yeah. yeah. And then how does, um, okay, because nowadays everywhere there's potential for crisis, right? Yeah. Um, terrorism or, or theft or, yeah. or computer cy- cyber warfare, cyber yeah. crime and um, disease and you know pasigurang na 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 right? How do corporates deal with crisis? Um, of course, they must have their holding statements, yeah. But uh, the most important thing is uh, to understand how they can actually work together with the press, with the media. Um, they have to understand the media and uh, how they need to manage breaking news. 
you know the media needs a, 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 a an hourly yeah, yeah yeah hourly updates and all that you know what can you give the media how do you work together with them you have to understand so i always advise my client you have to understand how they function what uh what they need at this hour at this hour and if you cannot do that what else can you do to make sure that there is something out there yet at the same time you are protected so so uh, it's basically understanding the the world will not go to war people will never go to war if they understand each other same thing like reporters and also people on the other side corporates yeah yeah okay so i know you don't have children yeah. but if you did right what are the three professions you would uh, advise them to go into do whatever you want that will make you happy you know um uh, but what makes you happy what makes me happy is what makes the person happy it's uh, you have enough money to finance your lifestyle and uh, That's number one. number one number two is you enrich other people's lives that's very important because for, you know you know what my happiness is when i am able and at the end of the month pay the salary of my staff i feel so good you know because you know i will say oh hari ni dapat gaji boleh pergi shopping you know when i listen that's to that's a the, big deal it's uh, it's it's it, people if you're an employee you really really uh, you feel yeah. so good when you listen to that you know because you're creating uh, in islam you say you bagi rezeki kepada orang you know so to me that's very important that gives me happiness you know creating opportunities for people to live a life and then you know uh, and enjoying their life working with me and then we pay them good salary there's a mutuality to that yes. relationship yeah, yeah. Okay, what's the third thing the third thing is basically uh, helping uh, giving back to the community because uh, I do that a lot uh, because I feel that um, uh, when you do that you cleanse yourself with all this you know ill thoughts and all that uh, I, I do lots of uh, uh, talk for the unfortunate and also people who cannot afford to pay me uh, you know so I actually give talks to children to to uh, to uh, students to people in rural areas to uh, single mothers I actually do that uh, quite regularly because I feel that it will make you feel good when you help people and to realize that there's a big world out there. You don't have to be uh, in this situation just because you don't have any other friends and suddenly somebody here is giving you alternatives in life that you can actually uh, do to to make yourself happier and 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 make yourself uh, and, and and live better. Yeah, so I I I understand one of your three points was money, but not excessive money. And I get the impression nowadays people are chasing excess wealth, excess material goods, big houses, many cars, um, international holidays, um, boarding school for children. You know, UK, Australia. I think it's perfectly fine as long as you are grounded. You you care for others. You know, you can be multi-millionaire, whatever, you go spending around the world. It's perfectly fine as long as you help others and you make sure that others are also um, are taken care of because uh, in Islam, you pay zakat, meaning, you know... Um, you pay it forward, right? Yeah, yeah, you're paying forward. You actually help others. If you do that, it's fine. If you don't do that, nah, that's the that's where the trap is because then you don't you stop caring for people. So I think it's perfectly fine. If they can manage it well, then why not? But yeah. don't go... Uh, stress yourself just to make so much money and then even spending it is even uh, is also stressful then yeah. what's the purpose yeah yeah, yeah. so now you're 57 um what are the <laughs> and you got another 50 years to go right the around there right um what are the advice what are the messages you would tell your 30 31 year old self right mm-hmm. so i mean if you were looking at in a time machine now yeah. and look back upon your time when you're 31 years old what would you tell you what would you do right uh, what would you do the same and what would you do differently? Well, uh, when I was 35, mid-30s, I was trying to figure out what, uh, 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 after this, what would I do, you know? How do I make sure that I will live comfortably when I retire? Yeah. You know? So, so I, even thinking about retirement at that a age? Long, long, yeah, uh, uh, then, because, because I, I wanted to uh, retire well. Uh, I mean... Uh, comfortable. Like. Comfortable and also doing good good things. Yeah? Because... because I see some of my friends right now. What they do is just stay home, uh, take care of the choo choo and all that. I don't think uh, that's good for them because I think yeah. they should be contributing to to the to the community in many other ways. Yes, the same thing. Yes. Why stay home when when you are at the peak and of you've your got all yes. this information, all exactly. this knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's no such thing as uh, staying home retirement. No, you cannot do it because uh, you see, my late father when he retired. Uh, at the age of he went for early retirement at 50 
and he didn't know anything he fell sick after the first week Alamak. yeah he fell sick and then later on he decided to give tuition lah to the kids next door and he decided to do business and then uh, and then uh, you know participate in the, in the uh, uh, grandchildren's uh, uh, parent teachers association he was the only grandfather in the PTA you know? so so he did a lot of things and that made him uh, made his life exciting so you cannot retire you will fall sick after the first week point number two to the yeah. 31 to the 31 year old Sohaimi yeah <laughs> okay What would you do differently? What would you do the same? Uh, I any, would, re- any regrets? Uh, no regrets, but I would have, uh, well, um, at that time, um, uh, well, okay, uh, move backwards, I would have um, learned more, uh, you know, uh, study other things, uh, for example, uh, other industries, so that, you know, it will have, you will have alternatives in life, you know. Yeah, for example, choices. yeah, choices. For example, right now, I do consultancy in media, I do crisis, I do branding, and at the same time, I run a cafe, which is totally, totally, totally different. different. Yeah, and then I'm also a designer, and I'm going to be a singer, yeah. <laughs> so totally different. And, uh, and you can only do well if you have good knowledge about the industry. So if, uh, well, flashback, if, uh, if 30, uh, 31-year-old Sohaimi, I would have, you know, one, I would have learned a lot more things than what I managed to grab during that particular time. And because it will help you later on in life to make lots of choices, you know. Suddenly you have this much money, where do you want to invest your money? What kind of work do you want to do? What kind of things that will make you happy? So these are the things that you need to do with knowledge. Without that information, it will be bad because you'll be stuck at doing things that you know. Yeah, are you a big investor? Uh, no, I I'm a very small investor, uh, very small. But I invest a lot of time in other things, lah. You know. Yeah. So what you do with your money? Uh, I invest in my business, in my cafe, and all that. And a little bit of savings. And then it churns inside, like a it true businessman, yeah, lah. True, yeah. So I I put a lot of money in my cafe, in my boutique, in my backpackers hostel. So hi, Mr. Laman. It was a privilege to talk to you. Lovely. I finally get to talk to you in person. My goodness, you know, we. I only. You see, I, uh, and you are actually quite nice uh, because <laughs> I think you're very fierce. Because you, why do you have to put this very fierce persona? No, it's, it's only a show, la. You know, you know when the business <laughs> show is, right? <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you on, you on YouTube with 10 yes. million views, oh. 100 million views. Oh uh, yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, brother. <laughs>